So thank you. Um, this is our first time presenting in the public track, and I must say I'm very excited and uh, somewhat humbled to be here amongst uh, my colleagues who have been paving the way for the last few years. Uh, Capricorn has announced a merger with Nile Therapeutics. will be uh, publicly traded in, by the middle of November, uh, so look for us then. <clears throat> Our goals are in the prevention and treatment of heart failure. Shown here in this schematic is the disease process that we're looking to treat. So I think many of you are familiar with heart disease, so I'll go through this rapidly, but just suffice it to say that when a uh, coronary artery is blocked and blood flow is stopped distal to the tissue, Ultimately, it leads to remodeling of the tissue. That is the creation first of scar, and then the heart tries to accommodate those changes in the development of scar by expanding and, and uh, becoming a larger organ. Now, if that's your bicep or your quadricep from running or, or exercising, you're glad, but in your heart, it changes the uh, physical properties of the organ such that uh, pumping blood to the body becomes um, something that's attenuated and therefore leads to the chronic disease called heart failure. We have uh, clinical programs that are addressing both the prevention of adverse remodeling and hoping to uh, halt the progression to heart failure and also in the treatment of advanced heart failure itself. So our first clinical trial, which actually was done by our academic colleagues at Cedars and Johns Hopkins, used an autologous CDC, that is a cardiosphere-derived cell, CAP1002, our frontline product. Uh, we use an intracoronary delivery. We feel that it's the most effective way of getting the cells where they need to be, putting it right down the infarct-related artery. It was a proof of concept in human study, 25 patients, open label, 17 were treated with cells, 8 received standard of care, which is obviously the best medicine has to offer. And the results of this, uh, what we consider to be a groundbreaking study, was published in The Lancet in 2012. In this graph, which I'm guessing many of you have seen in one way or another over the past year and a half, it shows the, the data that um, has uh, spurred the company forward and uh, has led to significant development of our clinical programs, which was this relatively unexpected but extremely significant reduction in scar mass in patients that received cells, both at six months and at 12 months. And as you can see in the flat bars shown on the left-hand side of the graph, um, the ones that are not hatched, you can see that the uh, standard of care controls, although they got the best we had to offer, didn't do anything to reduce the size of the scar that uh, was caused by that heart attack. On the right-hand side is what we consider to be the first proof of therapeutic regeneration. That is the creation of new viable mass that was contractile and functional in patients uh, that previously did not have that. And again, uh, the substantiation of what I learned in graduate school and, and many of you also learned is in your own uh, education in the sciences is that the heart was a terminally differentiated organ and once you had scar all you could do was work with uh, what you had left and uh, sort of hope that the, the outcomes would be favorable with that. Now, we think that this actually will have a, a beneficial effect on, on clinical outcomes and have moved forward into later stage clinical trials um, to, to test that, but not with the um, autologous product, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. So how do we think our CDCs work, and, and actually think is, is probably an erroneous word in this situation, because we've published um, upwards of 50 papers in the literature from our academic labs and also from Capricor ourselves to demonstrate the mechanisms of actions by which we think these cells are working. Uh, let me just briefly go through the laundry list with you that uh, CDCs, CAP10002, uh, secrete growth factors in cytokines that uh, decrease apoptosis, that is the programmed cell death or suicides of cells that think that they're injured, ultimately leading to the uh, increase in scar or dead tissue. Uh, we believe that uh, probably one of the most important mechanisms by which the cells work is to recruit endogenous stem cells, those that are housed within the organ itself that come to the site of injury and repair the tissue that's there. And we know that by doing fate mapping studies in small animals where we can actually see which of the new cells were created by the donor and which of the cells um, may have been created by the recipient. Uh, cardiomyocyte proliferation is stimulated by these cells, probably via the mechanism um, that I just spoke of, as well as the release of uh, paracrine factors, and the cells are angiogenic. We like to think of our cells as a local drug delivery system, too complicated to find one factor that we can infuse, but a whole uh, 
slew of factors are released that um, lead to the beneficial effects. And then we know that the cells are cleared from the heart without any side effects. So we're not looking for cells to go in and, grant, uh, and graft and, and make the heart their home. They go in there and do their job and then go away. So as far as we know, uh, CDCs are the only therapeutic on the, that uh, both reduce infarct size and promote the regeneration of cardiac muscle. So I like to use this graph to say what CDCs might be able to do in terms of relevant clinical outcomes. So I, I'm sure you've all heard, I hear a lot, you know, infarct size, what does that really mean? You've reduced the scar, okay, great. Um, so this, this uh, work and, and the graph that's shown here is a survival curve or an event curve, um, sometimes called a Kaplan-Meier analysis, was published by Edwin Wu and his colleagues um, from Northwestern University in 2008 in the journal Heart. And all he did was look for the stratification of infarct size as a relevant indicator of progression outcomes. And so what you see here very clearly is that patients that had a small heart attack, less than 18.5% of their heart, went on to have um, a li high likelihood of an event fee survival. Maybe they uh, took a deep breath, went to the gym, lost some weight, changed their eating habits, whatever we all do, and, uh, but were okay to go on with their, their lives as planned. Whereas those who had a large heart attack, 18.5% or greater, their outcome wasn't so favorable. Um, despite their own best efforts and the efforts of medicine, they led to, uh, tended to have a greater events. So they tended to have a heart attack or a stroke or some other issue that uh, would lead to a re recording of an event. If you actually look at what the CDCs did, let's, let's just take a moment and, uh, and think about that. Both the CDC uh, treated group and the control group started with an infarct size of 24%. A full quarter of their heart was affected by the heart attack. Patients who were treated with CDCs after one year saw a reduction in their infarct size to 12.5%, which theoretically moved these patients from a very high risk group to the low risk group. Whereas those that were treated um, in the standard of care control patients, as you saw from the previous graph, had no change in uh, their potential outcomes clinically. So we think this is, is a good indicator and perhaps a roadmap to what we'll look for in future trials in terms of clinical outcomes. So I'm sure um, some of you have heard, and, and it's been in the press, and um, the uh, previous speaker also took some heat because of our data a few weeks ago, that there's been some suggestion that perhaps the therapeutic regeneration that we believed we saw in humans was just some kind of error of the measurement. MRI, um, you know, has, has its measurement errors. And so what we did is obviously we couldn't uh, go back to the people and, and uh, dissect out their hearts, but we could definitely do a validation study in animals. And so what we did is we did a, a study in pigs which, as many of you know, is probably the best animal in which to start study cardiac disease because of the similar cardiac anatomy. And what we looked at was uh, we gave them a, a heart attack, just like a pa patient would have. And then um, three weeks later, we did a baseline MRI, just like we would have done in the patients. And we did the intracoronary infusion of the cells. And then the control patients, or control pigs, uh, they just got the, uh, the vehicle that the cells would be delivered in. And then nearly three months later, we uh, took the pigs back to the lab and we did a variety of things. We did an MRI, looked similarly to how the patients would be looked at. We took out the heart and then we did the MRI of the explanted heart to see if there was any anomalies or differences there. And then finally we did what would be considered sort of a, a gold standard, which is TTC histology, which means we cut the heart into slices, we stained it, and it was dead versus live tissue. And that's um, a good indicator of, of uh, what's actually happening physiologically, but only, obviously, um, possible post-mortem. And what we saw here, and I'm going to try my best to see if I can get these to work. Whoops, nope, no chance. So can you go back here? And what we saw here in this, uh, in this study, and we have movies, but for some reason the the gods of, of video and, and technology were against us, so I can't get these to be. But perhaps the best indication of, of um, what we saw is shown in the, the top panels on the left, uh, going from TTC staining of the explanted heart to the um, ex vivo MRI image of the heart, and then finally on the right, the in vivo MRI image of the heart of the pig. And I wish I could show you the functional effects as well in the videos, um, so I'll, if you have time later, I'll show you on my computer. Um, but what you can see is such a marked difference in the, the treated versus the controls, um, as shown as evidenced by the, the graph at the top. 
uh, or the, uh, the figures at the top, it got to be so much so that the uh, fellows that were reading these could actually tell whether they were treated or controlled um, independent of, of whether they uh, were blinded or not. It was so evident that the scar had thinned and there's a band of healthy tissue surrounding the scar. And this is just, again, showing sort of the same thing, again, sort of in a sequential slice manner, and I'll uh, bring up all three so we can preserve time. And again, I think it's very clear to anybody who looks at this that even in looking at the sequential slices, the generation of new heart tissue is evident in the treated heart. So we, you know, think, of course, this is, this is not in a person, it's in, a, it's in an animal model, but it provides for us uh, good validation that what we think happened in the people in terms of therapeutic regeneration actually did occur. Additionally, um, the study was, of course, a proof of concept in human study. We, we ended up with far better uh, data indicating potential functional utility than, than we even had ever hoped or dreamed. Um, but, so I, I, you know, I'm caveat to, prevent, to present functional data in terms of trends, but, but let's just go there for a moment and say that um, if this trial had been 50 patients or greater, we probably would have seen um, significant increases in functional effect of the heart measured by end diastolic volume. And one of the best indicators in terms of clinical outcomes is end systolic volume. So we're thinking that in our next sets of clinical trials, which are obviously much larger and powered for these relevant endpoints, that we'll be able to see that there's a good functional effect and, and lead towards clinical outcomes of the cells in, in human beings. Okay, so now we had this what we thought was really amazing data. I, I think I've convinced you that at least these cells were, are worth looking at in, into the next generation of, of therapeutics, but we felt that the autologous model was just not an appropriate business model nor an appropriate therapeutic model. And uh, when I use this as, a, as an example, I always ask people in, in the audience to think for a moment. You know, you've had a heart attack. Um, it's, you know, you're feeling vulnerable. You say you're gonna sign up for a trial which might make you better you go home, you come back in, you go to the cath lab. Okay, we always say a biopsy is a you know, a, a safe, you know, minimally invasive procedure, no big deal. But you still, you have to put on that awful gown, lay on a cold table, you're sedated, you lose a day of work and life. We take your biopsy, we take it back to the lab, you're happy that you're gonna get your cells. We have some type of a manufacturing problem. There's a sterility breach. There's a growth problem. There's all the different problems that QAQC can prevent. Um, but despite your best efforts with an autologous, ther autologous therapy, you're out of luck. And then you, the patient, get that phone call saying, we're really sorry, you can't get your cells. We just didn't want to be those, making those phone calls. And so we decided to move on and, and look at an allogeneic model and uh, asked the FDA if we could do a study uh, in human beings using the allogeneic CDCs. And uh, the FDA said, okay, absolutely, after you show us that the cells are safe and they work as well as the autologous. And we did that. We went back to the lab and we did a, a large animal study again. And we showed, most importantly, that the cells were safe. They didn't uh, cause a clinically relevant immune response in the pigs and that they worked as well as the autologous cells. And that uh, gave us the ability and the motivation to move forward um, to our clinical trial, which uh, is called All-Star. And just shown here, and I'll go through this briefly because I think I'm probably running short of time, um, how, you know, sort of the, the process by which we manufacture these cells. So we start with a donor heart. Um, the master cell bank is created from what we call explant culture, so the heart is minced up into tiny pieces. The cells that bud off uh, become the master cell bank. Uh, when we want to make lots of drug, we pull a uh, tube out of the freezer and uh, go through the cardiosphere step, which is actually an independent product in and of itself that uh, is not in clinical trials at the moment. And then ultimately it's plated into a single monolayer uh, so that it can be safely injected down a coronary artery at a dose of 25 million cells and frozen and placed into this bag uh, that you see here on the far right of the schematic uh, photos, uh, which it can be pulled out of the freezer, thawed on the bench, and injected into the patients. So just to talk briefly about All-Star, All-Star is our phase one, two clinical trial. Uh, shown um, on the left are sort of the, the bullet points of information regarding this trial, ejection fraction, inclusion criteria of less than or equal to 45% by any modality. Um, in this trial, unlike Caduceus, uh, we used infarct size as an inclusion criteria because we know the bigger the infarct, the greater the potential effect. 
We're using a dual cohort model, so we're treating patients that are just like caduceus, 30 to 90 days post MI. And then we're also trying to see if the cells can have an effect in, in more static scar moving towards a heart failure model, those that are 90 days to one year post MI. The phase two is randomized, uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled. This time the FDA is, is letting us blind our patients so we can actually uh, look at the difference in a, in a very uh, statistical fashion. Um, we'll be doing the phase two trial in 20 to 30 sites in the U.S. Uh, using allogeneic, the uh, taken from the donor heart CDCs, and again, same delivery method, intracoronary. The phase one trial, which I'm happy to report, completed today. Um, had three uh, sites, Cedar sinai Minneapolis Heart, and uh, Scripps came on just a few weeks ago, mostly in anticipation of phase two starting in about a month. Uh, the phase one was 14 patients with a one-month safety endpoint. All 14 patients now have been treated. Um, we expect after DSMB approval to be able to move into the phase two. Uh, the phase two is powered um, to achieve infarct size reduction at one year. That would be our efficacy primary endpoint. But we'll be looking at the data at six months at a variety of secondary endpoints, including infarct size, and then encompassing LV structure and remodeling, LV being left ventricle. Uh, left ventricular global function, such as ejection fraction, the patient's symptomatic status, and biomarkers. And the biomarkers will have dual utility. Not only will we be able to see if they go up or down in, in our patients, but we'll also potentially be able to use them as indicators in the future of whether the cells are, are doing their job. So why do I think that uh, Capricor is well positioned for success in the, in the field of cell therapy? Uh, we have a unique mechanism of, of action. I've talked to you about therapeutic regeneration and shown you um, at least an indication that that may be the case. Uh, we have an off-the-shelf, thaw on the bench, deliver to the patient easily product. Um, we have a stable supply chain, so we know that um, the donor hearts will never uh, delay the critical path to manufacturing or patient treatment. Uh, the manufacturing is uh, a scalable model, and um, we've really brought in sort of the best that we can find uh, with Anthony Davies actually in the audience today and on a panel this afternoon to help us build out pre-commercial manufacturing. I actually believe that manufacturing and clinical need to be developed along the same trajectories such that you can um, never hit the, the door with a good clinical product but not be able to deliver those many hundreds of thousands of doses that we anticipate we'll, we'll need when we get to market. We have a, a broad and developing intellectual property portfolio, uh, both by our licensors at Hopkins, Cedars, and Rome, and ourselves. And we have a, a really stellar and amazing team that I feel privileged to come to work with every single day. Um, just briefly, uh, the merger highlights. I mentioned this at the beginning. Um, the company will uh, be Capricor Therapeutics. We anticipate the merger to close uh, at the end of November, middle of November of this year. Um, the structure of the new company will be that 90% of the company will be owned by the Capricor shareholders and 10% will be owned by the Nile shareholders. Uh, I will continue to run the joint company with the executive chairman as Frank Litvak and uh, we'll maintain our Capricor board with two Nile directors joining and uh, it's currently trading as an over-the-counter stock. We plan to um, uplist to NASDAQ as soon as uh, situation and uh, ability um, allow. Okay, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate your listening.